Grand Junction isn't what one typically thinks of when one imagines Colorado. A desert town with hot summers and mild winters lying on the confluence of the Colorado and Gunnison Rivers. A far cry from the high and rugged Rockies lying east of the city. Known as Colorado's wine country because of the climate, it's an otherwise unassuming city. In the early 90s, Grand Junction would be the stage for a series of bombings that would kill two and leave residents on edge. The Two Rivers Convention Center is a local hub for performing arts, events, and banquets. The night of February 14th, a banquet was held on vocational education. Shortly before 9.30, as people were leaving the event, a blast went off in the parking garage underneath the center. Softball-sized holes were blown into the sides of cars, and it rattled eardrums as well as the center itself. Shrapnel tore through Dennis Lamb's right calf, luckily the only serious injury. He was taken thereafter to St. Mary's Hospital and treated. A bomb specialist from the Grand Junction Police Department joined investigators on the scene. Fragments and blasting caps were found as far as 100 feet from where the bomb had detonated. Of note, there had been an uptick in bomb threats in recent months. Just two days earlier, the Veteran Affairs Medical Center had been evacuated for a bomb threat, though no bomb was found. Things were quiet for a few weeks before going back to chaos. At first, I thought it might have been a gunshot but a gunshot wouldn't make something jump off like that, said Laura Forkner, in reference to a clock that had been knocked off her wall. 12-year-old Maria Dolores Gonzalez stayed home from school because she felt ill. The Gonzalez family packed into their van for a trip to the mall. Her mother Mary let Dolores come along, not wanting her to feel left out. The van wouldn't start. A quick look under the hood revealed the battery wires were unplugged. They fixed the wiring, and as the van began to pull off, a bomb that had been placed inside the left rear wheel blew. Dolores was killed instantly, as the blast had sent shrapnel through her aorta. Her sister, mother, and brother came away uninjured. The lab results from the first bombing had still yet to be returned. So at this point, authorities were unsure if this bombing was related or not. On a mild summer evening, Henry Rubel and his wife Suzanne went to dinner at the Feedlot Restaurant and Lounge. The restaurant sat straight across from the Two Rivers Convention Center. Around 10.30, Henry and Suzanne got into their truck to leave. Suzanne noticed a silver cylinder laying in front of their truck. Henry went out to check on what it was, and as he raised the object to his chest, it detonated. The explosion bowed the top of their truck and stunned onlookers. Henry obviously didn't make it. Suzanne was unharmed, that is, at least physically. Police still didn't know if the bombings were related, but it would certainly have to be a hell of a coincidence. The following morning, ATF agents were flown into Junction. They would aid in the investigation and allow Junction police to handle a backlog of cases. There had still been no forensics back from the two earlier bombings. However, police did believe them to be pipe bombs. Warnings were issued in the local papers to notify police of any suspicious items. Residents were increasingly on edge from the seemingly random attacks. Soda and beer cans, mufflers, clocks, and more had people calling the police. The city of Grand Junction was on edge, understandably so. No one knew if or where another bombing could happen. The police needed to solve this case, and fast. At this point, investigators still didn't know if the three bombings were connected, or if they were the act of one person or a group. As such, each bombing was being investigated separately. The ATF and the Grand Junction Police would spend the entire summer reviewing lab results, following tips, and making a list of suspects. In total, they would have around 30 or so suspects in the attacks. By late fall, police were still unsure if the attacks were related. Looking at what we know, all the bombings happened in the downtown area of Grand Junction, a possible comfort zone. All three bombs were pipe bombs armed with mercury switches. With a careful hand, the perp could deliver the pipe bombs without setting them off. Once the bomb was moved in the right direction, the switch would activate, setting off the blast. All the bombs used caps from a brand known as COIN, a brand not sold in the USA for over 10 years at that point in time. Whoever made the bombs would also have to be good with electronics and mechanics. For some time, investigators went quiet. 
only giving occasional news briefs. Late December seemed like the investigation may have been getting somewhere. District Attorney Erkenbrack requested the formation of a grand jury. Around the same time, the ATF finished up their work in Junction and left. On the evening of February 18th, 1992, Junction police arrested 29-year-old James Ginrich. He was indicted by the grand jury on 10 counts, three of which are first-degree murder. James knew the police had been watching him for some time. Officers would hang out at the Swahiro Japanese restaurant where he washed dishes, or stake out his apartment on Ute Avenue. James lived alone, and according to those around him, he was quiet and maybe a little slow. He suffered from occasional outbursts of anger, however. James had more than a few tiffs with his boss, Eric O'Kindle. According to Kindle, at times he would get frustrated, yell, and leave. James would come back a few days later and apologize. Kendall would oblige and take him back because he, quote, was a good person. He was very honest. According to relatives, James Sr. was physically abusive, and James seems to have suffered for it, a social outcast without proper coping mechanisms. He was lonely and wrote in his diary about a desire to kill since he couldn't find love. James was a regular at Read More Book and Magazine and often killed time there, though the owners were apparently having problems with him as a customer. On one occasion, James attempted to order the anarchist cookbook from the store. Read More employees denied the order in light of the recent attacks. James claimed that this led to a dispute, but the owner Diane Osborne said otherwise. Osborne would later report James to the police. This would push James to the top of the list of suspects. Police would begin watching him more closely in early August. Before his arrest, police would search his house and his parents' house, though they found nothing to tie him to the bombings. On the second search, they found tools which were sent off for forensic testing. The tool mark analysis was a match. From the start, the trial was fraught with controversy. Accusations of an ill-fit and biased jury, contempt of court from ATF agents, allegations of misconduct towards the district attorney. Ultimately, the trial would go on. James would still be found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. He was also convicted for use of explosives and third-degree assault. One crucial piece of evidence, tool marks, has been called into question in the following decades. While at the time tool marks were seen as scientific as fingerprints, many now disagree. This, along with other forensic analysis such as blood splatter, ballistics, and bite marks, have either been debunked or called into question. So this begs the question, did James Genrich commit these attacks? While he may seem like a solid suspect due to his behavior, what got him convicted may have been nothing more than pseudoscience. In the nearly three decades since, James has appealed this trial multiple times. He still maintains innocence and has worked with groups like the Innocence Project to prove his innocence. His appeals have been denied 